So I know I'm standing between everyone and lunch, so I'll try to keep the talk uh, pretty short. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to say thank you again. I'm very grateful and honored uh, to MLConf for receiving last year's Industry Impact Award, and I'm very excited to be with you all today. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about COCO. This is a general framework for distributed optimization. Um, and this is joint work with collaborators at uh, ETH Zurich, Lehigh University, EPFL, as well as my advisor at UC Berkeley, Michael Jordan. So what's the motivation for this work? The motivation is that there are many people, like you all, I imagine, that um, are trying to solve machine learning problems with very large data sets. Okay, so how does this actually work in practice? You start with your data set and a problem that you'd like to solve, for example, classification. Beyond that, as we've heard a lot about today, you have to select the appropriate model to solve that problem. So one example is logistic regression. Okay, but under the hood, there's an optimization algorithm that you have to then select to fit that model to your data. And this becomes particularly important when we're looking at the setting where we have very large data sets because there's really an important component missing in this workflow which is which sort of um, system setting you're in. Are you on a multi-core, large multi-core machine, or in a cluster, cloud, supercomputer? Because that can have a very large impact on the optimization algorithm that you select to fit your model to your data. In fact, it's an open problem to know how to most efficiently uh, solve these objectives when our data sets are so large that they're distributed across multiple machines. So this is exactly the problem that we're trying to solve in this work. Okay, so what can be done um, in the distributed environment to solve these objectives? Well, you can imagine something very naive, which is that you could take an online method that works well on a single machine, that just processes a single data point at each round, and then naively parallelizing that in the distributed environment. So imagine here we're looking at um, these light gray squares are each worker machines, and the dark gray rectangles are data points on those machines. You can imagine processing just a single data point on each machine in parallel, then communicating that update back to the master where you try to converge on your final global model, and then iterating doing this over and over again. So this sort of paradigm would say, let's always be communicating back and forth between the worker machines and the master. It's nice because we have convergence guarantees about these types of methods, but in general it's not ideal for the distributed environment where communication is a known very large bottleneck because you're always going to be communicating back and forth between the master and the workers. So what else is there? Kind of viewing this as um, a paradigm here we have on the, on the other side, the other extreme, you, instead of processing just a single data point on each of the machines, you can imagine processing all of your data points multiple times and in fact solving k separate submodels, uh, separate models from all of your machines. And then doing something at the end like averaging them together. So this sort of paradigm says, you know, let's never communicate or let's only communicate once at the very end. It's great for the distributed environment because it's very low communication, but in general it's not ideal because convergence is not guaranteed for these types of methods. Okay, so what else is there? Well, very naturally, you can imagine something kind of in the middle. Instead of processing all of your data points or just one data point, you process a few data points on each machine in parallel before you communicate back to the master and iterate doing this over and over again. So this is what is known as mini-batch style methods. Um, it's nice because we have convergence guarantees about these style of methods, and the communication is also tunable. So what I mean by that is you can choose how large to make your mini-batch size, how many updates you want to process on each of the machines in parallel, to tune communication in whatever sort of systems environment you're in. So this is really a nice natural middle ground and it's used a lot in practice. However, there are some serious limitations to current mini-batch methods. One limitation is that typically people uh, formulate mini-batch methods by taking something that works well on a single machine and making sort of a one-off mini-batch style version of it. So you may want to, you may wonder how you can get more out of these very highly tuned um, single machine solvers rather than having to reinvent the wheel every time you want to use that in the distributed environment. Another limitation is that the updates made in mini batch style methods are stale. And what I mean by that is you go out and you compute updates in parallel from each of the data points, but you don't actually apply those updates to your model until you send everything back to the master. So you may wonder if you can improve upon that. And finally, once you do send everything back to the master, often to uh, guarantee convergence, you have to take an average over how large your batch size is. 
you can sort of view that as a step size. And because the step size is very small, that can slow you down in practice. OK, so these are exactly the limitations that we looked at when we were developing the COCO framework. In particular, instead of having these one-off methods, we've developed an entire framework that allows you to just readily apply single machine solvers into the distributed setting. Um, we have the ability to immediately apply updates locally. And finally, once we send everything back to the master, we take an average over the number of machines K. That's strictly less than the batch size. So you can think of that as allowing your updates to go further when they're back on the master machine. So these are the principles behind uh, the first version of the framework that we developed, COCO version 1. Um, so I'm going to talk about each of them in a bit more detail. The first is this idea of a primal dual framework. So what do I mean by that? At a very high level, um, the problems that we considered in this first framework are basically a loss plus a strongly convex regularizer. So this encompasses a lot of popular machine learning problems. Uh, we can solve these problems via their primal objective. Or alternatively, we can solve them in the dual. At a very high level, the primal and dual will arrive at the same answer for these problems. So you can solve either one. And the dual will always be a lower bound on the primal. So why would you want to solve this alternate dual formulation rather than the primal? There are several reasons. One is that having this setup is really nice because you have a stopping criteria given by the duality gap, given by how far apart these problems are. It also has good performance in practice. For example, it's a default in software packages like LibLinear for solving support vector machine models. Um, but what we saw in our setting, what is really important, is that this dual will be more easy to separate across machines. So it will be more easy to uh, distribute the computation on this dual objective. So what exactly do I mean by that? Well, looking at this dual objective, this objective is global in that it takes into account data from all of the machines. What we've done in COCO is we've instead defined this local objective, which just takes into account uh, data from a single machine. And basically, all we've done here is square out that uh, regularizer term, and now we're indexing over dual variables on a single machine for the losses. OK, so now that we have the, this local objective, the reason that we're calling this a framework is that we allow you to solve this local objective using any internal optimization method. So in this way, you can take something that works well, that you've tuned, some code that you've written on a single machine, and directly apply it into the distributed environment. OK, so what were the two other changes? Um, one is that we allow you to immediately apply updates on each of the machines in parallel. At a very high level, the difference um, is summarized in the following way. So in a mini batch style method, you loop through all of your updates on each of the machines in parallel. But you, don't actually, you don't actually apply them until you send everything back to the master. So until you sort of break from that for loop. Instead, in COCO, we're allowing you to apply the updates immediately after you make them on each of the machines locally. And finally, once you do send everything back to the master, um, we're allowing you to take an average over the number of machines k. This is strictly less than the batch size. And again, you can think of that as a step size. So it's allowing your updates to uh, move further on the master. OK, so these are all principles behind the first version of the framework that we developed. Uh, and this is really exciting work. This was back at NIPS a couple years ago. Um, and we got state-of-the-art performance compared to very popular distributed methods. But since then, um, in the last couple years, we realized that there were two limitations to the initial framework that we developed. The first limitation um, was this idea of having to average things on the master. That seems sort of arbitrary. You may wonder if you could do something better than that. For example, if you could add the updates directly together. And in follow-up work, we found that you could actually do that. And the way that we were able to do that is basically we modified the subproblem that we're solving locally to allow you to make more aggressive updates on the master. And doing this gave us stronger convergence, both theoretically and in practice. So this was follow-up work at um, ICML last summer. Uh, but since then, there was one other limitation to the framework, which is that L1 regularized objectives were not covered in our initial framework. So what is that? Uh, why is that important? I'm going to be talking about that now because this is very recent work. So in particular, L1 regularization. Why is this important? It encourages sparse solutions. So it's very important for uh, the setting where your feature size might be large and you'd like a model at the end that is small either for computational reasons or for interpretability reasons. So you might want to be able to interpret the features that you have in your final model. 
So it includes popular models like lasso, sparse logistic regression, elastic net regularized problems. But something that's important to consider and that we considered when thinking about how to use this in the uh, COCO setup is that often you're using L1 regularization because you have a very large feature size. And in this setting, it can be beneficial to actually distribute your data by feature rather than by data point, which is what we had assumed in the original COCO framework. Okay, so the question was, how can we map this all to the COCO setup? And the solution that we came up with um, and in the interest of time, I'm sweeping a lot of the theoretical results under the rug here, but basically we've uh, significantly generalized the models that we're looking at. Um, and what we found is that in this setting where we're solving these L1 regularized problems, it's actually beneficial to solve them directly in the primal rather than in the dual. Uh, and what's the reason for that? One is, okay, so we have this primal dual set up. We still have a stopping criteria given by the duality gap, which is nice. But now solving the primal rather than the dual is very common in practice. So that's the default in software packages like GLMNet that run coordinate descent uh, for these L1 regularized problems in the primal. It's also nice in our setting because if we're assuming that the data is distributed by feature, this primal objective will now be uh, more easy to separate across machines where we have one primal variable per feature. Okay, so. Um, let me just present some results that we have now that we're running this, this new version of the framework, which are exciting. Uh, so this is an example of one of the results. Uh, we're looking at uh, code written in Spark, running uh, distributed optimization, running this distributed optimization method on Amazon EC2 machines. And we have ProxCoco, which is that new version of the framework, shown here in red. On the x-axis, we have how long is it taking to converge. On the y-axis, we have how close are you to that optimal solution. So the goal is to get down to the bottom right corner of this plot as quickly as possible. And what you see is that ProxCoco, which is shown here in red, is converging much more quickly than these other methods. And let me just say briefly that some of these other methods, for example, uh, what's shown here in green, in yellow, and in pink, those are um, the methods that are currently in Spark's machine learning library. Um, this light blue one at the bottom, that's ADMM, that's a very popular, well-known um, distributed optimization method. Shotgun, that's in the very light blue, um, that's a very popular method in the multi-core environment. So it kind of drives home why communication is such a bottleneck for the distributed setting. Okay, so in particular, for this experiment, we're getting almost a 50x speed up over these other methods. And this was true, I'll just briefly show, for all of the data sets that we looked at, we're getting this very large speed up over these other methods. And again, the reason is that we have this nice framework set up um, where you're able to immediately apply these updates locally that really reduces the amount of communication that you need to do in the distributed environment, which is great because that's a very big bottleneck. Okay, so let me just summarize again by saying COCO, it's a framework for distributed optimization. It's flexible, so in the first version of the framework, you know, we developed um, this ability to have arbitrary internal methods. Since then, we've made it even more efficient with the COCO Plus work. Um, it has very strong convergence guarantees, and it has strong practical performance with low communication. And in this most recent work, ProxCoco, we've shown that it now is applicable to a wide variety of very popular machine learning models. So again, these kind of correspond to these three separate pieces of work. And um, for ease of nomenclature, we're calling the entire thing COCO, uh, which is all of these three separate things together. And we have a, a recent paper that kind of ties all this together and explains um, all of the applications together in one unified framework. Okay, so let me briefly say about the impact and adoption of this work. Um, the code is all open source online. We have implementations in Flink and Spark, and also uh, very recently in TensorFlow, which is exciting. Um, I've given numerous talks and demos about the work, both in academic settings like NIPS and ICML, but also at more industry-focused events, in including MLConf. Um, we have open source code and documentation. There has been industry and academic adoption, places that, for example, Google and Amazon, but also across um, academics. And uh, that's all that I had, so thank you. And you can find the code online, and you can find links to the papers on my website.